Neville, I want to start by just thanking you for making the time. No worries. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Cool. I think a lot of folks in the call already know some of Neville's work. And if you don't, I, I don't know if uh, guru is the right word. I'm sure there's a better word here, but he is a copywriting expert to say the least. All right. So I'm going to start with, I think the overarching question here, which is how is copywriting different from other forms of writing? What, what is distinct about copywriting? I think with copywriting, you're starting off with the idea that you want to convince people to do something. So you want them to take an action at the end, whether that's sell them on an idea, sell them on a product, or get them to sign up their email address, follow you on Instagram, whatever it may be. You start off with the idea of what do I want them to do? And then how do I craft that message towards that? Rather than you just start with a blank page and just go, here's my thoughts on whatever. You start off with the action. So I always tell people to work backwards. So whenever we review someone's page or something later on today, we'll work backwards. What's the point of this page? Before I even look at it, before I look at the copy, before I look at the images, before I look at anything, what's the point? What do you want them to do? And so I think a lot of people that write newsletters, that write blogs and stuff, and, and me too, for 10 years, I was writing a blog without any idea of what I wanted people to do at the end of each blog post. And it's what do you want them to do? And so most of us don't think about that first, which I think is a little bit of a mistake. Like you'll look back later and been like, damn, I could have got so many more people on my email list or so many people subscribed to my YouTube had I thought about that first. So that's why I think copywriting is different, a little bit different than normal writing. And so I'm curious when people maybe do have a clear intention with, or maybe think they have a clear intention of what action they want somebody to take, what do most people get wrong when they go to write something that they hope will inspire action? What are some of the they things? Have too they many things they want people to do. So in the perfect world, I want you to subscribe to my YouTube, subscribe to my Instagram, my Twitter, my email, everything, right? Buy my stuff. But the problem is like, there's only so many things you can make people do at a time. And so I think they try to get too many things in there where it's just like, okay, you only get one. And what happens is because there's such a constraint on just like one call to action, it makes you figure out what the most important thing is. So for example, we always go back to emails, subscribing for emails. And I know you got a lot of newsletter subscribers. The email is still the only thing you fully control. If you build your business on Instagram, guess what? Instagram is going to not show you as much in 18 months as they get more popular, right? In the beginning on YouTube, you posted anything and they'll just show it a bunch because they didn't have a lot of content. Now they have too much content. So now they have to see who deserves those views and, and those recommendations. And so I think with email it, or just picking one thing you want people to do, it's okay, you want them to follow you on Instagram or do you want their email address where you can send them an email to say, follow me on Instagram. Then the next week you could send them another email saying, follow me on Twitter. Then next week you sit, promote a product. So I think it really makes you figure out what's important. And generally it always comes back to email. <laughs> it's, that's the punchline. It always comes back to email, it seems. Yeah, I'm curious too, if your intention is I want to get a new email subscriber, a new reader of my newsletter, um, mm -hmm. like, I, okay, I'll make that my singular focus. How do you think, how do you coach people through getting folks to actually take the action? What are the, you know, how do you speak to someone in a way where they're yeah, the, the number one thing is if you have really awesome stuff, people will subscribe, right? So the, the, there's not actually that much work you have to do sometimes. You just have to ask the question in the beginning, what's the end, what's the punchline here? What do I want them to do? The way I think of it is, for example, let's say someone shows me their about page. I don't care what's on the about page all that much, actually. What I want to know is what do I do next? So imagine you walk into the clothing store express or something like that. And you're like, you ask one of the people at the, that just work in there. You're like, Hey, I want some new shirts to make me look more professional. What do I do? That's like the about page. They're going to say, okay, what you first need is this. They're going to direct you somewhere. So that's the way I view a lot of these pages. It's what do I do next on this page? Or do I just leave? So what do I do? So I always like to have like, where are you going to go next? That's all I want people to do. Yeah. yeah. And something I think, I think you've done so great with copywriting course with a lot of your content is I just find myself whenever I'm reading your stuff, just totally sucked in and like, it's almost just very fun. And I guess we were talking earlier, like maybe not everyone necessarily is going to have the fun voice, but how do you think about creating stuff that really sucks people in? And when I read your stuff, I can't stop scrolling. How do you encourage folks to inject that same sort of momentum or almost like visceral appeal? There's a famous copywriter named Joshua Sugarman who had this thing called the slippery slide, where it's just basically like a slide. So you get them at the top and you hook them in from here to here. I, I don't think a lot of these older copywriting terms are as, they're somewhat applicable today. 
But back when a lot of these were written, it was a different time. It was a different time when like newspapers and stuff like that were king. So it's a bit of a different time. I don't think you have to necessarily try to hook people in as much anymore. I think you just have to do really interesting things. So for example, a lot of blog writers that just start today, name a topic that you've written about, Stu. Just The opportunities that writing online creates. Okay, got it. Yep. Opportunities that writing online creates. Great topic. So what most people will do is they'll be like, here's a bunch of reasons you should write online. Okay. And they'll put like, uh, it amplifies your voice. It's awesome. People can find you. Maybe you get a job, something like that. The standard shit. But then another guy writes that. Then Brendan Short over here writes that same article. Like all these people go and write that same article. And it's okay. Same old stuff. So what I always try to do is just like, how can I stand out? Can I not play that same game that they're talking about? What if I say the opportunities writing online, bring online and experiment. And I say, I'm going to start a blog about knitting because I really like knitting. I don't really, but whatever, or like sewing or something like that. So I'm going to start a blog and over a month, see how many subscribers I could get. So I would do an experiment like that and then document that experiment. That article is far more interesting than just like some rando telling you like the, the benefits of writing online. Getting that real life thing. And that's what I've noticed through my whole career. The person that goes out and does an experiment and documents it is usually the one that gets most of the attention. Real world experiments somehow are even better than online experiments because starting a blog on sewing and putting it out there is not that risky. But if you go out there and try to do a sewing class or something like that and document and show people like in the same room with sewing machines, whatever, that's a really interesting topic. Yeah, it's so funny. This There's now this like idea of building in public being seeming almost like this novel idea of how to build an audience, get attention, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I think you've been doing this for quite a while, which is like actually going out in the real world, documenting what you do. If memory serves me, I think you did something in Austin, like redid copy for local businesses in Austin. Could you share oh, maybe doing, some of these experiences? Yeah, we did a, I was walking down the street and there was a shoe hospital. And this is one of those examples of that's a post that has returned so much money over the years. So many email signups, videos, blah, 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 have been sparked from that one single experiment. I was walking down the street in Austin, Texas, and there was a thing called a shoe hospital. And I always laugh when I go by because I was like, shoe hospital. Just, I don't know, it just sounded like a goofy name. And then one day I saw the guy out there and I was like, yo, what is a shoe hospital? He's like, duh, it's a shoe hospital. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he was like, this guy's an idiot. So he went, we went inside and he showed me a shoe that was like all jacked up and everything. And he's like, this is the one I'm working on. And it was like a brand new shoe. And I was like, oh, a shoe hospital. It just clicked. And I remember thinking, I was like, how come I walked by that place so many times and didn't understand that? And all the guy did was show me a before and after of the shoes. So I thought, let's make this guy a sign. So for 156 bucks, I made him a little A-frame sign. I designed it on Photoshop and just a bunch of before and afters I stole from his website. And that, that's all it is. It boosted walk-ins by 50% every single day that place was open. So that was an idea. That was a simple thing that we did that really changed the game. And I documented that process and put it online and it was a hit right away. And, and the reason was instead of saying like how to make a sign for the street, that wouldn't have been that good of an article. But what I did was I, I did an experiment actually doing it. And people learn by analogy. So instead of just telling them what to do, just show them what you did and they'll pick up on it. But that, that's way harder, Stu. That's, that was a thing that like, it doesn't come along all the time. Like that opportunity, if I was like, let's do an experiment, it's a little bit hard to find it. So those things are more rare. But if you can do a real world experiment, people love that stuff. I designed a billboard and got it created. And that was a huge hit. So I, I was like, how do, you get a, how do you get a billboard? What's the deal? So instead of saying like how to make a billboard, we did how to make a billboard. Oh, by the way, we got one done and paid $900 and it was up for six months. And then you can actually see the pictures of the billboard. So those real world experiments go a long way. I love it. I think um, totally another thing I think you've done brilliantly is think about maybe positioning. Again, not, not quite sure if that's the right word, but thinking about, okay, if there's a million people talking about physical advertising or how, to, how local businesses should do marketing, there's one powerful way of writing about that in an interesting way, which is running an experiment in the real world and documenting it. But I've also seen you do a lot of brilliant work with like, how do I almost escape competition and write about this kind of crowded space from a very unique angle. And mm -hmm. the example we were talking about earlier is the, the travel blog post where there's a couple traveling the world and you encouraged, mm -hmm. maybe they should take this romantic angle. I'm curious how you'd encourage people to think about avoiding competition or entering a crowded space and standing out. 
Entering a crowded space and standing out. Well, generally what people did to get there often won't work totally well. So I, I think a little bit before the call, we're trying to talk about SEO and the writer's dream for any of their articles is rank number one on Google. That, that's usually like, the thing is, I think there is a bit of an arms race for SEO right now. Whereas a lot of people are realizing the value of it. A lot of, uh, I think software companies entering content marketing was like the, the death knell of the smaller publisher where like they have so much money being fueled by their SaaS product spent on content marketing that they can make actually really good stuff and make a lot of it consistently over the course of 10 years. And so there's a lot of those people entering. And so if you wanna do just how to articles, I don't think that's gonna be good enough in the future. So the way that I try to differentiate myself is if you look at my own stuff, I use a lot of silly drawings and stuff. It's just the way I draw, it's kind of my personality. And I always felt like, Whenever I try to be too corporate and like everyone else, it just blends in with everyone else. So I was like, I'm just going to go full goofy and see what happens. And oftentimes, like those were the articles that really blew up that would just took a totally fresh approach. And it was so funny because like big SaaS blogs would link my stuff to be like, look at Neville's really goofy version of copywriting or something like that. But because it, they were at least going after some angle that it was goofy, I was getting all the links and then ranking number one for all that stuff. Unfortunately, we just changed our domain name about a month and a half ago and lost a lot of the rankings. So they'll be coming over back over the course of a year. But it, on that topic, what's also interesting is I think there's a million ways to get the word out there. So is writing an article the best way to transfer information from my brain to your brain or my brain to everyone's brain? Not all the time. Sometimes it's a video. Sometimes it's a combination of all of the above. I think that's, we have so many, if this is the 1400s, yeah writing something on a piece of paper and distributing it by hand, that'd be the way to get the word out. But now there's a bazillion different ways to do it. So I think utilizing a lot of those and figuring out the medium that's best for you, that you like, is also very important. Some people are built for video. Some people are really good on camera. Some people, not so much. So I think you need to figure out where you stand on that too. Yeah, I was going to ask, is that something you encourage folks almost like to lean into whatever they're, like how would you encourage folks to maybe discover that kind of I call of it doing medium. experiments. I, I, I love, instead of saying, I'm going to start a podcast and everything, like I started a podcast, but it was like an experiment. I was just like, I just want to know what are the mechanics of starting a podcast, all that. Because it, if you're going to do any of those things, you have to do it really well. So I encourage people to do a lot of little bitty experiments. So try making a video on TikTok. Try making a video on Instagram. Try making a video on YouTube out of one of your articles and see if you even like it. See if it, people respond to it. I think that's the best way to go about a lot of this stuff. Try lots of little mini experiments and don't take any of them too seriously. Otherwise you'll just never start. Like you look at some of the quality of a lot of YouTube videos and you'll be like, dang, they're so good. And I'm just using my phone to do this. I don't know. Try it. It's not a big deal. If you try a bunch of little experiments, you'll figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at real quick. It's easy to figure out what you're not good at or what you don't enjoy. Some people truly hate being on video. And for those people, being a writer is the way to go. So little experiments is the way I encourage it. Yeah, I love that. And I think, I know, I think there's this, like the internet and, and everything that exists today just enables all these creative uses of video, music, et cetera. And I love a lot of your work, just as this great mesh of images, videos, and, and blog posts. So I want to get a little bit into copywriting specifically and how you've thought about you know, using these various mediums to really help uh, drive results for some of the companies you've helped for your mm -hmm. own business. And we had a couple folks submit some questions beforehand. And one of the kind of most common ones was, what are some examples of businesses that you've seen really transform with better copy, using email better, writing better copy? I know you've helped out the hustle and AppSumo. Would just be really curious to hear some some stories of you know, the cool thing results. is uh, once once you change something in the digital world, it amplifies so big, right? So if you're email cold emailing 100 people a day, you have a sales team. If you if we go and change that email up by generally making it shorter, like almost so comically short that it's like a sentence, if that changes someone's reach from one percent response rate to five percent, that's huge. For some of these companies that sell large ticket items, it's insane. So generally what it is on, we go through people's homepages, about pages, contact pages, that kind of stuff, uh, product page, like e-commerce product pages and change up. So for example, if there's a product selling on Amazon, we'll go through and change up the imagery to where it has like arrows pointing at certain things, highlighting the features that alone 
can dramatically change the results of sales for an image. We helped a, a car company recently, or sorry, a car like polish company. They were in a very competitive space on Amazon. And we just changed up all their images. We didn't do anything to their, their, um, their actual copy. It was great. So we try to think where are most people seeing it? So for example, on e-commerce for Amazon, most people look at the images and don't really read the copy. Have you ever really read the product description from front to back on an Amazon listing? Probably not. You probably just skim it a little bit, but you probably do watch, look at hundred percent of the five images you're allowed to put. So we try to see like, where's the most impact going to be and go to those places. So on Amazon, it might be the images, right? We try to tell a story with those images on a SaaS product page. A lot of times, if you have a SaaS product, I love software products because it either does the thing you want or it doesn't. There's no in between. It just does it or it doesn't. So a lot of times they describe their product. I'm like, guys, just show it in action. So sometimes just putting a GIF of the, let's say it's, it turns PDFs into Google Docs, right? What if you just made a GIF of this? It doesn't even need text. So a lot of times that's where we come in and that's where the biggest value is. For The Hustle, for example, I've been involved in a company called The Hustle, giant email newsletter list. It was just modifying Facebook ads and just trying out a bunch of different ads. A lot of it is modifying the homepage to get the highest amount of email signups. So we start with the why. What do we want this page to do? And for example, on The Hustle, you couldn't even find a blog on the homepage. All you could do was sign up your email address because when you forced people to do that, that's the action that happened. Whereas if you're like, we want people to sign up and then we want them to sign up for trends and all that stuff. It actually lowers the conversion where if you just let everyone do only one thing, guess what they do? That one thing. So it copywriting, it's funny because it's like the easiest thing to do, but the highest result. It's a great skill to have. So if there's some actual examples, we can go through some people's stuff or anything that you have specifically. Yeah, I was going to say, awesome. We'll do it in the workshop on the back half because I think that's going to be a ton of fun to actually put. This like I said, in. instead of talking about stuff, I love just showing it. I'm a big totally. shower, not just talker. Yeah, another another question that folks submitted beforehand is if I'm a writer or a blogger and I just enjoy sharing my ideas or telling stories and I've never really thought about this idea of, as obvious as it sounds, right? Getting people to take an action. What are some of the best ways that folks can just think about, like embody the copywriter mindset? and to Get emails. Get email, get people to follow you on some platform, preferably email, because then you can email them multiple, multiple times. Look, I was in the exact same spot. I was writing online since 1998. It was like hand, like blogs weren't even invented. And then I started blogging officially in 2003. And for the, the next, people didn't know you can make money online. So I was in that exact same spot where I was like, I just really enjoy doing this. And I was like, ah, I don't need to do these email pop-ups and shit, which back then were quite annoying because computers are slower and it would like slow down your computer and stuff. And I super kick previous 2010 Neville for not doing email signups and audience building a lot sooner. One thing I found that is really helpful that people underrate is an autoresponder. So a lot of people talk about passive income and all that crap. The thing that does it for you is an autoresponder. An autoresponder is basically just timed email. You set an email to go out at this time at this time. So for example, if someone signs up to copywriting course right now, we're actually redoing our autoresponder, uh, but it performs so well that I almost don't want to change it. We, we did the, the domain upgrade, so we have to change all the name, uh, names and everything, but it performs so well. And what happens is when someone signs up for my website, there's about six months worth of emails that go out every two to three days. And it's all my best stuff, right? So some people will, people will email me all the time from the autoresponder and be like, how do you keep pumping out such great stuff all the time? I'm like, dude, I wrote that two years ago. But the cool thing about the autoresponder is that it takes the work I did today and it amplifies it every day for the next couple of years. So let's say Jen Vermet on the call, she writes an article today and it goes out, she posts on social media and people are like, cool, yay. But then no one reads it after that. She just wasted her time. You want everything you do to recycle and go back into the feedback loop. So every article that's every big article I make, I'm going to also probably make into a YouTube video. And then when people find it from YouTube, they can click the, the article and maybe find me. So every piece of content I make amplifies my reach. You don't want to be one of those people that spends a ton of time writing something and you go back down and then time writing something and go back down. I was like that for 10 years. I have some pictures and stuff where you can see analytics on some of the posts I've done with nevblog.com, my original blog. I never did any email collection. I never tried to build an audience. I was actually anti-building an audience. How stupid is that? 
And, uh, and you just see my traffic over this, the years just stay the same, like all that effort for nothing. Whereas when I started doing it with copywriting course, the traffic just went up every month because I was amplifying the work of my old post through autoresponders and email signups and such. Yeah, I know. I know something you've talked about is like you maybe become more intentional with choosing what to write about. Cause I think that's another uh, challenge this group has is like, okay, can I, should I write about political news that's not going to be relevant in two weeks from now? Or should I write something that maybe I could email out two years later and still find mm-hmm. useful? How have you thought through like where to focus your effort on, on a topic basis and, you know, where to really invest in writing? Long yeah, there's a constant push and pull of that. One, I like to write about stuff I'm really interested in right now. If you're really interested in something right now, I would say do it. The other thing you have to do is there are certain questions, like when you look at Ahrefs and look at keyword research or something, there are certain questions that come to mind that everyone asks. So for example, there was, I had an SEO guy once tell me, he's like, hey, Neville, this is in the beginning of copywriting course. He's like, how come you haven't written a post about how to become a copywriter? And my answer was, I don't think people should become copywriters. And I was like, I think copywriting is more of a skill, not a career. And he's just, then why don't you say that in the post? And I was like, shit. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> like, because so many people were asking that topic that I was like, I don't want to encourage people to become a copywriter. I'm like, I have a unique take. I don't think most people should become copywriters. So I wrote about that and that became a, a top post for years and years and years. And so when I go back in 2000, now that we, we switched our domain, I have to redo a bunch of articles. I'm going to go back only through the really top articles and redo those and not all the rest that are way down there because it takes so much time. So I would go for the top keywords in your domain. I would at least write a post about those top three keywords. And then you write about what's interesting from there on. Because, so for example, one of our, one of our clients that's killing it, she's a doctor and she quit being a doctor because she's making more money with her, like her like online stuff, which is crazy. And she's telling people how with low scores, how to get into med school, because there's a lot of ways to hack that system. And one of the number one keywords is something to the effect of like how to get into med school with low MCAT scores. And she was like, she said the same thing as me. She was like, the way to actually think about it is blah, blah. She told me this great explanation. I was like, why don't you write that in that post? Because if everyone's asking that, you always have a link to send people. Whereas right now you're having to like type this out to each person. So for the top questions in your industry, I would write those posts probably. And then from there on, go... I would not like try to SEO every single post, but I would try to go for things that are like high in demand, but also, I don't know. There's a lot of people that talk about stuff that's totally not in demand at a left field. That's very interesting. So I would personally write about what you're interested in and then also make sure to answer the top couple questions in your industry. Is that a satisfactory answer? I hope so. Oh my God. I'm rethinking everything. My God. My, I've definitely take the, taken the nav blog approach to blogging, which is anything that I've been curious about, I've been writing about, and it's definitely a grind. It's definitely not a... What if you were to put every time you finish a really good article, you're just like, hey, why don't I just put this into my autoresponder? So what you just did, you increased your asset value. You now have an autoresponder that's four sequences long instead of three. And then you do that again and again, then two years from now, right? Someone's going to sign up to Stu's email newsletter and all your greatest hits come to them, to their email address every two to three days. They're going to be like, how does this guy keep cranking out the hits every day? Even if they know it's an autoresponder, they probably wouldn't have seen those articles. Yeah. So I think so long as you're writing and it amplifies everything you're doing, it feeds into your little machine that you've created. I think that's very important. So I try not to do work. That's, uh, for example, I always think I go to yoga classes all the time and I always feel bad for the yoga teachers because they spend all this effort trying to get you to have a good yoga class. But when that class is done, all that effort's gone and they have to do it again and again and keep putting that effort in. Whereas my stuff, it's, I write it once and that made me a little bit more powerful for the next two to three years. Yeah. Love it. Well, I think um, what we'll do is I'm going to, I'm going to ask Neville about a couple very specific like copy frameworks and questions that I think everyone in the group, if you're not familiar with, will find very valuable. And I, I found valuable to just revisit and then start thinking about if you're courageous enough, choosing a piece of copy, a landing page, your subscribe page, the page <laughs> you start up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We will, we'll be constructive. Volunteer to the group because for anyone who joined late, we're going to do a live copy review uh, on the back half of the call. So I'm excited about that. But Neville, what is ADA and how would you explain it to noobs like us? 
Ada means attention, interest, desire, action. It's just popular copywriting formula. And honestly, I think it's the only formula I've ever used. There's all these other copywriting formulas out there. I think for the most part, they're all like very specific use case, maybe. Ada is something you can use in your relationships. You can use it in your copy. You can use it on your newsletter. You can use it to write a cold email. And what it basically means is it's a very working backwards way of trying to sell an idea. So for example, I always give this example of getting someone to drink water, trying to sell you on an idea of to drink more water. So what I would do is I would say something like, I would try to get your attention. I'd be like, hey, Stu, you look like decently in shape. Do you ever work out, Stu? <laughs> sure, you know, from time to time. Yeah, from time to time. Okay, cool. So let me tell you some interesting facts. Interest, this is the I in interest. So some interesting facts are the way that water works in your body is water is a universal solvent. And then when you combine that with amino acids, that turns into proteins. So whenever you take protein plus water, amino acids, it builds muscle. So if you go into the gym and you were to chug a liter of water right before you go to the gym, before you go to the gym, mind you, every workout you do will have a 30% more impact, meaning you'll grow 30% more muscle for the exact same workout if you just drink a liter of water before you go work out. It's interesting. So then, so the next time you go to the gym, let's say Friday, you go to the gym, wouldn't it be useful to just drink a liter of water first and then go to the gym? Cause you're getting more impact for the, the work you're already doing. So the action I'm presuming saying you should take is drink a liter of water before you go to the gym. And so now I probably just convinced a bunch of you that you should probably drink a liter of water before you go to the gym. And the funny thing is that's complete bullshit. I made that up. I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea, but the point is I applied it to that ADA formula that's in my head. And I, I know that would probably convince you to drink more water before you go to the gym. So similarly, you could do that with anything, whether it's trying to get someone to buy a book or something like that. You'd be like, here's, I have two of these books over here. Here's one book I wrote a long time ago. I can convince you to buy the book with the ADA formula. Instead of saying, buy my book, it's awesome, blah, blah, blah. I would say to this crowd, I think, let's see ADA. So attention, how do I get this group's attention? I'm like, if you have a newsletter, or you write online and you think that you're just like treading water in the same place, but you want to amplify your writing a lot more, you might want to listen to some of the, the reasons, the things I explained in this book. Then I would talk about a couple of interesting facts about the book. So that could be a couple of interesting testimonials about it. It'd be a couple of numbers about it. So for example, what's interesting is this book is only 42 pages long. You can read it in 15 minutes. Another interesting thing about this book is that a lot of people have read it and it's completely changed the way that they write. Another interesting thing about this book is that a bunch of companies buy this for their entire sales teams and I'll just be sitting around, they flip through it and they're like, oh, that's a good idea. And they completely change the way that they write cold emails and make a lot more money in the end. So uh, a lot of people who buy a $5 book, it ends up having hundreds of thousands of dollars in impact, perhaps even more in their life. So what I did was I wasn't trying to sell you this book. I just had it out just in case but I could apply it through the ADA framework to try to sell anything. Whereas if you just said, hey, Neville, try to sell your book right now, I'd be like, I haven't even thought about this book in a while. I don't know where to, I don't know where to go. So the ADA formula is extremely helpful in trying to sell an idea, a product, or anything. Yeah, I think that the interesting distinction for me is like the difference between maybe interest and desire. Could you speak a little bit to that, that distinction? Just zoom in a little bit, because I found myself when you're breaking down amino acids, my curiosity was peaked and I'm definitely curious. And it's hard for me to, to maybe draw the distinction between desire, which is then- Yeah, so the, the interest stuff is interesting testimonials, interesting things about it. The desire thing is trying to make you internally want to do it. So if, if I tell you to eat your vegetables, like you tell a kid, eat your vegetables, he's just like, why? What's the point of this, right? Whereas if you say, you know how you got beat up on the playground and that you're a little wuss? If you eat your vegetables, you're going to get bigger and stronger and you can beat that guy up. Then the kid will be like, I want to eat my vegetables. So it's tricking the person into thinking that they want this. That's what desire is. Now, here's the thing. This is a common question. What's the difference between interest and desire? Sometimes on a cold email, we're working with so little space. You're not going to have that much time to, to do that. If you have more space, you can often flesh those out into totally different parts. If you have very little space, sometimes they're almost combined into one. So I would not spend too much time on that distinction, but desire is making them internally think, I want this for myself. Yeah. Love it. And what, yeah. uh, just one other concept. We have our first volunteer, by the way, of uh, Alex, congrats on being courageous enough to throw your landing page to the wolves here. 
One more final question before we go in. We have another volunteer. This is great. One more question I just want to ask, and maybe this is a bit more pertinent to longer form copy, but I've heard you talk a lot about the importance of kind of giving more than you ask, if you will, and finding kind of a ratio between giving value before you earn the ask. Just curious to hear you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean. That's a, are you talking about like the give ask thing, like Gary Vaynerchuk? Totally. Yep. I think that's a really interesting concept, especially for like content marketers. I have found that to be totally true. If you put out the person that really gets big is the person that just goes on a tear, putting out good stuff for two years. And then they launch a course or software or something. And so then you're just like, okay, I'll check it out. Yeah. So the way I think about it in content marketing, I developed, so with, uh, I'm part of a company called AppSumo and we send out like basically a daily email newsletter trying to sell you something every single day. And in the beginning, people were like, how are you writing all these? And I'm still listening to you, even though I know you're trying to sell me something every time. And I'm like, I came up with a a number. It was 70% content, 30% sales. If you give someone 70% good stuff and only try to sell them up to about 30% of the time, they never get mad at you. It was a weird thing. And the way I equate it to, let's say you walk into a CarMax, like a, a big car dealership, right? And you're looking for a brand new Toyota Camry. And as soon as you walk in, the guy sees you and is like, hey, you want a car? I'll put you in a car. Let's go and start signing a contract. I can get you financed right now. You'd be like, whoa, 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 back off, dude. Like this way too much sales. Instead, let's say you walk in and there's a very helpful fellow that says, hey, what are you looking for? Toyota Camrys? I've driven five different Toyota Camrys over the last 20 years. I know everything about these cars. If you have any questions at all, want to take a test drive, no pressure. You come to me, I'll, I'll answer it. So then you're like, okay, cool. Yeah, well, what's the best Camry to buy? He's like, oh, let me show you these. He's basically educating you on stuff for a long time. Now, after a while, if he's, we've seen all the different ones, are any interest in maybe taking one home today? That's not that bad, right? You, you're not gonna be like, bro, back off. Like that, that's not gonna happen. So I always thought that if you do 70% good content and 30% sales, people will never unsubscribe from you is what I found out. Not unsubscribe, people will always unsubscribe, but people won't get mad at you or unsubscribe just because you're just like pressuring them too much. So just remember that 70% content, 30% sales. That was my magic formula. Amazing. I think it's time to put the magic formulas uh, to the test. Oh, with... let's see. All right, if I scroll up the Zoom chat here, I think, Alex, I think you got yours in first. Let me, uh, can I share my screen here? Yeah, here, let me give you the, the keys. There we go. Yeah, let's see what happens. All right, excited for this. All right, so the first one, whoops, sorry, chat windows and everything go all crazy when I do that. Let me see the chat. That was, who was the first one? Oh, it was Alex, Alex. Alex Edmonds? Yep. Sweet, Alex, if you wanna say what's up, how's it going, man? Good. Sweet, let's start right now. Okay, so first of all, so from the copywriting mindset, what I wanna know first is what's the goal with this page? I think I could tell, but <laughs> I wanna hear it from you. To get people to sign up to my newsletter. Okay, so it's cool because there's only one thing on this page that he's doing, which is sign up to the email newsletter. Let me take a wild guess. And if someone lands on this page, what are they gonna do? Probably sign up to the newsletter. But let's use Ada a little bit to give people a little bit more chance. So I land on this uh, page and I'm gonna use a cool little JavaScript thing where I can type whatever I want over here. So revenue research, join others learning about revenue models. Okay. So right now I'm still not convinced to buy. So Alex, can you talk about some previous stuff you've talked about on the uh, interesting stuff that people like on here? So I wrote an article about how podcast players make money and the different revenue sources they have. I did one about podcasts. I did another one about how athletes make money, how air airlines make money. And I'm writing one about how free apps make money. How free apps make money? Yeah. Why should someone learn about mo- models of revenue like this? What benefit does it have? I'm trying to target like independent developers that don't know too much about how to monetize products so that when they're ready to make a product similar to that, or the, the ones that I talk about, they'll be ready to monetize right away and they'll be able to make money from their product. Be ready to monetize product right after you've built it. Okay, so basically what we're doing here on the spot 
is just telling what you already know this stuff, but you haven't effectively communicated that to me on the site. So I'm just writing, I'm, I literally just ripped what you said and put it on here. Mm. So this will make it a little more clear what you're trying to get them to do. Become more powerful by knowing how to make money off the projects you develop. Yeah. You could even like, I, I personally don't like the negative stuff just because that's not what I want to put out there in the world. But you could even, if you want to even be more aggressive is don't be a poor developer, <laughs> right? You could say something like that. That does hit them in the gut. I personally wouldn't write that because I just don't like that kind of stuff. But basically stuff like this is all it is. This would just probably give you a higher chance of getting someone's email. If you just add a couple of things that you put on there and then tell them why they should join. So become more powerful by knowing how to make money off the projects you develop. Any other things that people have said about your emails that they like? Any positive comments they've said? I'm a good writer. Go ahead. To the point as well. They say, I know how to get to the point. I've only written four of them right now. Those are what we call like a vanity testimonial. Alex is awesome. Okay, mm. but what's in it for me? So what I'm looking for, and it sounds like you just got started, but something like, read one article on how apps make money, then developed my own. And now it's getting 200 signups per day. That's an example of a testimony that might be interesting on here. Okay. You could put so that somewhere. What I would under. want is like, what someone achieved, not like what my content is about or like a compliment about my content. There's many ways to put it on there. So if you have space to put more of them, which right here doesn't look like you have a lot of space, you could put basically a wall of testimonials that where they don't really read individual ones. They just see so many of them. They see a hundred testimonials that they're like, this is probably good. It's like on Amazon. If one person five start it and that's it, just one, you're like, well, it's a little skeptical, but if a thousand people have five started, you're like a thousand people can't be wrong. So there's different ways to show testimonials like that, but it, it is best to show results testimonials rather than Alex is a cool dude. Okay. Yeah. You, you're like, I don't care if you're cool. I want to know if you're good. So it's best to show those types of things. Okay. Wow. This is very informative. Thank you. Right to your inbox. built something. Yeah. And you can easily split test a lot of these types of things. I think since you're just getting started, split testing is probably way out of your realm right now. You need a lot of traffic for that to be significant. So I wouldn't do it right now, but just something simple like this. Oftentimes when we consult with a company, this is just all we'll do. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't like mind shattering stuff. It's like I said, copywriting is very low effort, but high result. Mm. Yeah. And once you have a high converting page, you just leave it. You don't do anything. That's it. That's the cool part about it. There's no extra work. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Does you. That makes sense. Yeah. Sweet. Amazing. Thanks for volunteering first, Alex. It's great. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. No problem. So I think Alex. Clay is next. Clay Hudson from H Clay Houston is the Clay new nickname. Houston. All right. Okay. So this is the first time seeing this. Whoa, Stu, what do you think of this page so far? Do you know what to do? I'm not don't, sure. Don't, don't look do. at it too I, hard. Don't look at it too yeah. hard because most people don't. So what, no. I, what I first do is I'll put on what I call like the caveman voice. This is so stupid, but it's like the, I, I always use this. I imagine you know one of the old school Geico cavemen from that commercial a long time ago, like a dumb caveman. Is, uh, and you're just like looking for thrills and you're like making me read crap. And zero at like what I, I don't even know what's going on here. So I'm very not likely to sign up for this right now. So Clay, if you want to, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, talk about it, what are you trying to get people to do here? I'm not even going to read this. Well, yeah. Hey, what's up guys? <laughs> what's up, man? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for putting this on. And it is pronounced Houston, like the city. So okay. that's a nightmare. Perfect. <laughs> so what do you, uh, all, obviously you want people to type in their email. Got it. But what, right, yeah. what exactly is going on here? I'm very much a novice and I'm just trying to, it's a fiction based newsletter. I, I curate short stories that I find on like Reddit and just some authors that I work with and stuff like that. And it's like kind of thriller horror short stories. 
And so I, I tried to keep the language playful. If you look at the last line, it's go subscribe or else or something like that. Or I think it says it'll keep you come crawling back for more, like it or not, that sort of thing. And it is just limited because it's on Substack. I can only, there's only so much custom customization. So it's, so thriller stories, monster stories, that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. It's all fiction. Are you into horror fiction? So why don't we just say that? Like, once again, yeah. I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just copying what you said and just putting on here. I'm doing nothing creative whatsoever. Zero ads, like you're talking about ads. I thought for a second when I skimmed this, just like blear the eye, look at it. I thought you were talking about marketing because I saw zero ads. So yeah. I know, I, so what's happening is Clay, you're in the box. You've seen this page like a thousand times. So it's, it, it doesn't mean anything to yeah, you anymore. Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's the same thing, yeah. Stu, I'm sure like on your own webpage, you're probably, I've seen it so many times. I don't know what else to do. I do the same thing with my own. And then someone random will just be like, why don't you put that there? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. damn it. I literally have no idea what other people think about it just because, like you said, I've looked at it a thousand times. How about this? You'll love our email that goes out every Wednesday. So almost, if you say that, let's see, do, 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 I probably, the submissions are welcome Part. So now instead of just asking for their email, you're asking them to do something else. So I think we're going yeah. a little off path. Yeah. So, so this is my, my, yeah, this is my about page. It's not the primary landing page. Again, Substack, it's limited. So I figured I would just show you the about page and get your feedback on it. Yeah. So are you into thriller stories? Are you into horror fiction? Are you into monsters? So really right away, we okay. can deduce what you're doing. So you'll love, you'll love my horror fiction email that goes out every Wednesday. Okay. Sign up here. Even something like that, just simple as that, oftentimes can really change the amount of signups that you get just because it's yeah. so clear. Neville, one quick question I had for you is how do you think about like copy length for something like an email sign up page? The shorter, the better, shorter, the yeah. better. Like the hustle.co check out this page. It's just, there's only one thing you could really do over here, right? There's just not yeah. much. There's some stuff here. Yeah. You really, you, you can't even get to the block. So generally these are what's known as like a squeeze page. Basically it squeezes you to doing one thing. So the less, the better. I would almost even, I don't know, is there like a picture of a monster you can put right under the, the subscribe button or something like that? To like if inject you go, some of your personality? Yeah, if you click on the logo in the upper left-hand corner, it's a it's the cat from uh, Alice in Wonderland. Huh. It's kind of a- And will most of your readers know that cat? Oh, absolutely. I ran a Facebook ad with that picture as the primary image and it got really good engagement. People like quoting the movie and that sort of thing. So people are very familiar with it. Yeah, it's got it. It's a very spooky character. And so people that are interested in this genre typically know who it is. I personally like putting some of my own kind of like a personality in it. Like I'm a big yeah. emojis user in real life. So I would probably say something like that. It just, it, it, you're just trying to transmit what they're going to get. And if this is the kind of personality they're going to get, show that. Right. Yeah. So that's all like, like there probably wouldn't be much else I would do to a page like this. Now I know this is your about page. We're using it as a homepage right now, but yeah, about page. So if you're going to do an about page, what we want to show is like why you are credible in this field or some examples of what they're going to get. Yeah. So like maybe screenshots of somebody's uh, comment saying they got chills from reading a story, something like that. Ooh, now you're thinking. I got chills from reading Alex's email. My husband, why I looked white as a ghost. I don't know. So whatever would be interesting for horror. Like personally, I hate horror because yeah. it makes me scared and I don't like to be scared. <laughs> but, but the people that love horror love to be scared. I don't get yeah, it. Yeah. 
but I know there's a whole huge category of people that love that. And so saying stuff like that makes them want to read it would be great. This yeah, would absolutely it's... repel me, which is probably what you want. You don't want me on your list. <laughs> exactly. So right, it's okay yeah. to be polarizing a little bit. Yeah. It's a very passionate niche. That's for sure. Yes. It's kind of, it kind of reminds me of like rock, like hardcore rock or something like that. Like yeah, like metal, metal or something. It just yeah. has this like loyal fan base that just For loves sure. their heavy metal. So yeah, yeah, little things like that. If we were doing an about page, I would probably actually add a little bit more about you. Okay. About Alex. Reading horror fiction at age four and my mom kept taking away my books. Yeah. So it, it's not really focused around me. It's not my own writing. I go on like Reddit and just repost people's stories for now. At some point, it'll be exclusive content and I'll put it behind the paywall. But for now, it's other people's stories. So I don't know if I should get my own personality involved too much in it. I, what do you think about that? Why not? Yeah, it is coming okay. from you. Yeah. Yeah. So it could, you could say something like that. I'm an active Redditor with yeah, 75,000 yeah. karma. Yeah. Contribute to slash, you know, r slash horror all the time. Or, or let's yeah. say you're a mod or something like that. Like that would be an interesting reason to follow you, right? Like yeah. why gotcha. I constantly search the scariest stories yeah, that's exactly curating. what it is right there. It's just curation. There you go. That's it. That's a reason to follow. So entering, getting someone to enter their email in nowadays is not that big of a problem. It used to be back in the day because spam filters were not very good. Now, if you keep spamming me, I hit that Gmail spam button. You're gone, buddy. I don't see you again. So it's actually very easy to moderate your or edit your email than before. So like getting people to sign up is not that hard right now. So I think just a few little things like that's it. I think that'd be a great way to do it on an about page. A little something like this would go a long way. Maybe a picture of you or because it's the horror category, maybe like your avatar. Yeah. Something like that. Cool. Yeah. That's it. That, that, awesome. I don't think there's much else that goes into it. Amazing. Well, I, oh, I just sorry, drove by a, uh, I just drove by a Bucky's the, the Mecca. <laughs> Nice. Bucky's it's a giant <laughs> Texas gas station. Okay. Oh, no. That's the, like the, the size large, of the world. It sounds Texas. Yeah. It is pretty magical. <laughs> yeah. Uh Neville, are you down to do one more buzzer beater here in our last four minutes? Yeah, sure. Which one? All right. I think uh Jen is our we'll, we'll end on Jen's page. Let's see. All right. This one. Hey there. I'm Jen. Welcome to my online home. I'm on a mission to learn it all. Okay, so it sounds like it's like a I'm learning and I'm gonna do it online. Facts about me. So like I said, I'm just coming in clean. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I know a lot about you already because it's facts about me. I like that. Traveling, I love connecting, my promise, follow my journey. Not bad so far. Oh, I was about to say pictures and you have some pictures over here of you. That's yeah. awesome. So as a homepage, one thing I would suggest is probably putting this subscribe thing a little bit higher on the page just so more people will probably see it. I know that looks ghetto, but not much format we can do right now. But I would put that little subscribe thing over there. And then the other thing is to get people to follow you, it used to be like you have to give away some 5,000 page PDF, all that stuff. With sumo.com, what we notice is that you actually don't need a crazy like call to action. What my website says is 85% of my writing goes to email. That's it. And people sign up. So I think you could say something along the lines of that. Or how about I share what I learn over my email list. I hope you follow along. Like your style does not seem very pressure or anything. It seems like if you want to follow, it's cool. Keep that style. That's it. I think, I hope you follow along. Subscribe button under there. That's it. I think that would do really well. This is a pretty solid page so far. One thing at the bottom is you have to subscribe. I would probably put a bigger button under here to say that read the blog or something. Okay. Is that something you want people to do? Yeah, no, I do want people to read my blog. <laughs> yeah, so it's I would definitely, job, but yeah. yeah, I would definitely put a little bit of a easier thing because a lot of times people are not going to be seeing your page like I'm viewing it now. They're going to be seeing it mm -hmm. like this. Mm. 
So yeah. you currently have no blog thing at the bottom. What you could do is maybe even put it down here at the bottom. Read the blog. Little things like that go a really long way. You have to remember, most people are probably gonna read your page on a mobile. So I have to like click this myself and yeah. then click blog. That's mm -hmm. a lot to ask of someone. So I just make it a little bit more interesting. Okay. You could also say, I share everything on the blog and then link the blog or something like that. Okay. Yeah. These are re really small changes that go a long way. Just remember that you make a simple change, but what's happening is you're storing yourself in this computer and it's serving it up thousands of times. So every time someone loads it up, that change is being implemented for them. So that's why copywriting, just like little changes on the web can be amplified so far because robot Jen is actually doing all the work for you now. Yeah. Okay. That's really helpful. Thank you. Anything else you see here, Stu? Ultimately, I thought this was actually a pretty good page. Yeah. I'm already a fan of Jen's writing, so I'm too biased because I'm already a happy subscriber. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I try not to change things if it's already working. If it's already good and everything passed the test, then yeah. you pass. There's no reason to really change it up. Sorry, yeah. what were you saying before? I was going to say that I've been considering just removing the my promise section because I start, I put that on there since day one because it was like a promise to myself, but it's mm -hmm. also like a promise to my audience of trying to constantly be in the arena and pro like constantly improve. But mm -hmm. I don't know if that's actually necessary and if it like takes away from getting to the pictures like where they're Good done. point. So I did think that was probably the weakest part of the page. However, I did like it because it's part of your personality. So what if we, let me try something. Let's see if we can redo this part real yeah. easy and make it a little bit better, but keep the same ethos. So my promise, how about, so is this promise to you or? It started to me, but now it's to my audience. because That's fine. The audience For, forget the audience, Get, be selfish yeah. about it. So it's, it's okay. So what if you say, let's say we bulletize it to strive to become an expert writer and lifelong learner to learn to think in different ways. It's almost like your little manifesto or purpose. Yes. And, and honestly, you should keep it to what you truly think. So if it's just a, a, a oath to yourself, that's mm -hmm. great. Don't make it to the audience and water it down for us. That's yeah. one that's not as cool for you. So you'll be less motivated. And then we can sense that whatever. Yeah. And I was trying to think of testimonials and I've inspired people to start running. I started like sharing my running journey, my reading journey to pick up a book as a dyslexic. And like, I've inspired people to start meditating when they never meditated before. So those are like my testimonials of like email subscribers coming back to me that they have instilled the change that like I've shared with sharing my learning journey. And those are like some of the things as I was like thinking, I want to find those screenshots and put those somewhere or quote them like you were saying. I think that would be pretty cool if you had, I wouldn't say get rid of facts about me. I'm just using this as an example, but yeah. like nice things people have said. Yeah. And you could include three, four quotes over there. That could be interesting. So the other thing is I like that you said you're a dyslexic. I, you didn't really mention that on here. I think, I guess like the concept of being vulnerable is interesting. Like I'm just, oh, where did I go? I'm dyslexic, feel self-conscious about it. I want to overcome it. Something like that can really resonate with a lot of other people who are dyslexic. And then strive that I would be better than I was before. I personally think that one's whatever. You can learn through my weekly newsletter, learn from it all. Yeah, so all I did here was just take out a lot of the excess bulk of that section and just put it into little bullets. And that way you can have a guiding light. Like anytime you're wondering like, how should I approach this? You can go back to your little promise and say, does it meet these requirements? Yeah, I yeah. love that. That's really feels like me too. So thank you so much. Exactly. You should leave it to feel like you and not try to copy other people. Don't copy Oprah because Oprah's Oprah and you're Jen. Like it's just going to be different. It's not going to be the same. And honestly, it's the people, if you've ever seen someone like come out of nowhere, like in the music industry or something, it's usually because they're just weird. Like they're so different. Like the systems of a down of a world or the Lady Gaga of the world, the Madonnas of the world. There's this guy, Hobo Johnson, that I just discovered that I'm just like, this guy is so freaking weird in the way he approaches music that it, it catches you. So don't be afraid to like be you like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Awesome. No problem. Great, great job already. Honestly, nailed on the head already. <laughs>
Neville, I know we're over, but I do want to ask, is there anywhere you'd recommend people go if they really want to get started with becoming more serious about building well, their copywriting skills, getting more familiar? Where should we send them? I think I tried something interesting recently. So this is a 15-year-old idea I did, and it's called copywritingcourse.com to start. And what it is, it's a sidebar. It's just an iframe. This is super old school. And I basically put all the content I have on the one little sidebar so you could just consume it really easily. And really what I was looking for is we want to go through and redo a lot of the articles after our domain name change. And I was like, how do I even view all my old content? And there's not a good way to do it. But I remember way back in the day on nevblog.com, my personal blog, which I still occasionally update, I had this thing called a timeline viewer. And I wanted to be able to go through and just look at what I did over all those years. And I had this stupid iframe that doesn't work very well in mobile. But I remember thinking like, this is so easy to read. And so I implemented that on copywriting course. So if you want to do that, I also have talk about a unique homepage, but it converts at 10 to 11% every day. So I leave it. You can sign up to my email newsletter list. I also have a uh, youtube.com slash copywriting with a K. And I post a lot of our interviews and stuff that we do with people. So I just interviewed my buddy, Sam Parr of The Hustle. We do some pretty fun interviews. You can follow me along over there. Amazing. And we're going to email out the recording to everybody. We'll edit it, email it out and send links, all the links Neville just shared. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining, especially uh, those courageous enough to volunteer their work. And <laughs> Neville, can't thank you enough for, for carving out the time. Uh, thanks for having me. It was fun. Thanks for everyone for uh, volunteering your stuff too. I hope it helped. Amazing. Cool. I will send the recording out the next day or two and hope to see everybody on Neville's site learning copywriting. It was certainly one of the best investments I made uh, last year. So thanks again, Neville. Thank you, man. Thanks everyone for joining. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. See y'all.